Okay, so, so far we have talked about uh, Fourier series representation for periodic signals in continuous time. So let me remind you because we, the last class was on Friday last week. So the, the thing that we had discussed in the previous class was, I have a periodic signal in continuous time. I pick omega naught equals to two pi over capital T. Um, and I can write my X of T as an infinite sum of of a complex exponential signal e raised to JK omega naught T. Okay, so there, this is an infinite sum. It's important to note that. Now, of course, not every signal, not every periodic signal will have infinite number of components, but for instance, square wave will have infinite number of components in the signal itself. And this process, oh, and we also figured, I, I guess, let me go back to the, to the equation. Yes, yeah, so this is how we compute an, so an is, one over t integral of xt e raised to minus j n omega naught t dt. So that's how we compute a n. Let me try to, let me write it, uh, copy it in that. So a k is one over t integral zero to t e raised to minus j k omega naught t dt. This is how we compute the coefficient, the spectral coefficient of the periodic signal X of T. SP, spectral coefficients of X of T. Okay, now this entire process of going from the signal space to the spectral coefficient space and back, that is known as the Fourier series representation and we will denote it FS, Fourier series. So XT, FS and AK. So what this double arrow means that from the signal space, I can go to the spectral coefficient space. I can compute the spectral coefficients and from the spectral coefficients, I can go back to the signal space using the inverse Fourier transform, uh, inverse Fourier series. Okay, so this is the notation. This is the notation we are going to be using for the rest of this class. In fact, this is the notation that you will use for the rest of your life. This is the notation for Fourier series. Uh, representation. Uh, quick question. Yes. Uh, what was that uh, fancy looking symbol uh, with the arrow this, again? This is F. This is, this is fancy F. Uh, so can we just use a non-fancy F? Yeah, you can use a non-fancy F. Um, well, do you want me to use non-fancy F? Okay, so this as is- As long as it doesn't matter to you, then it's fine with yeah. me either way. Yeah, I, I guess I'll use the non-fancy F. So this is the FS. This is what is used in the book. Uh, this is typically how I write it, FS. Uh, but I can I can basically use F S if that is clear to everyone. Okay, so all of these are similar, like they it represents Fourier series. Okay, so what we are going to study now are properties of Fourier series, and so let's dive into the properties. At this point of time, are there any questions? This is just a recap of what we did in the previous class. Okay. Okay. 
So the first property I want to talk about is linearity. So I have X, Y, periodic. These bo they both have periodic signals with the same period, same fundamental period, T. Then X plus Y, okay. So the linearity means that XT, FSAK, YT, FSBK, this implies uh, can th someone's uh, mic is on. Can you turn off the mic, please? On. Thank you. So if you add the two periodic signals, their Fourier series coefficients or the spectral coefficients will just get added. In fact, if you have two complex numbers, A and B, and you take the Fourier series of AXT plus BYT, then you will have to change the Fourier coefficients accordingly. Is this like our Z transformation, so to speak, or similar? Uh, so Z, okay, so Z transform. So we are talking about Fourier series, then we'll talk about Fourier transform, then we'll talk about uh, Laplace transform, and then we will get to Z transform. So, oh, okay. so there, is, there, there is quite some time before we, I'll, I'll introduce Z transform in the class. I think it's the last chapter or like one of the last chapters of the book. So uh, the reason I was asking because in uh, 2050, um, that was like the first thing we went over was the Z transformation. So yeah, that's why. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll get there. We'll get there in a bit. Okay. So what's the proof of this? Well, let me do the proof of this one because it's fairly straightforward, and the proof for the other statement is also. Uh, the same. So I have xt equals to ak phi k. So remember, phi k remains the same for both the signals because they both have the same fundamental period. k equals minus infinity to infinity. yt is summation bk phi k t. I'm going to add the two signals. the coefficients will also get added because phi kt is the same for both the signals. Okay, so this is how you compute the Fourier transform for sum of two periodic signals that have the same period. Okay. Let's talk about the second property, which is time shifting.
and so I have a signal XT whose Fourier series is AK. Now what happens if I translate, I mean, I shift the time by T naught. So I get the new signal as XT minus T naught. So I'm just moving this signal in time. Turns out that the Fourier series of this signal is given by e raised to minus j k omega naught t naught times a k. So let's look at why this should be the case. So let me define y of t as x of t minus t naught. So I know that because x is periodic, y is also periodic. Now I'm going to do the following. The Fourier coefficient of y t would be given by one over capital T integral zero to t or any interval of length t. I have y of t e raised to minus j k omega naught t t t. This is one over capital T Okay, so I have x of t minus t naught in the integral. How can I change the, the, uh, the variable for integration so that I get something like x of tau in the integral instead of x of t minus t naught. So I can do change of variables. I want x of tau in this in this integral. So I'm going to do a change of variable where I define tau as t minus t naught, which means d tau equals to dt and t equals to tau plus t naught. Now I can make the, so when t equals to zero, my tau will be minus t zero. This will be t minus t zero. I'll have x of tau. Okay, so this is what I get. Any questions so far? I think this is a pretty straightforward application of change of variables, which will be our favorite method in this class. So what I get is one over T e raised to minus J K omega naught T naught. So I can take that out. I'll have
and this is exactly equal to AK. So that's an easy derivation for what happens when you shift time in the signal. How does the Fourier transform change? One thing you will notice is that the absolute value of BK is the same as absolute value of AK. So the magnitude or the strength of the kth component doesn't change the strength remains the same because the strength is directly proportional to the amplitude. But, uh, uh, but there is some phase change in the, because of the E raised to minus JK omega naught T naught term. There's some phase change in the amplitude of the signal, but the strength remains the same. The amplitude remains the same. Okay. The third property that I want to talk about is time reversal. I have a signal XT. I know that the Fourier series of XT is AK. If I reverse the time axis, then the Fourier series would be A minus K. I'm going to leave the proof as an exercise and it will follow basically similar arguments as we have done in the previous two sections. Okay, one thing you will notice is when you do the time reversal, the period doesn't change. Okay, let's look at multiplication of two signals. So I have XT whose Fourier series representation is given by AK. I have YT whose Fourier series representation is given by BK. Both of them have the same period, capital T. Then it turns out that of course, XT times YT is also a periodic signal. Now the Fourier series representation of XT and YT is actually quite complicated. So let's try and derive the expression. Well, uh, let me actually give you the expression and then we'll derive it. I don't want to keep you guys in suspense. So XT times YT, the Fourier series is given by summation 
L equals minus infinity to infinity A L B K minus L. You can think of it as convolution of Fourier coefficient. This is the convolution in discrete time. Well, it's K is not time, but, but it's still a convolution operation. Okay, any question on this? Um, just real quick, it's probably a dumb question, but for the subscripts L and, and K minus L, when I see um, something in a, a uh, summation with a subscript, my brain forgets what to do with it because usually when I see variables in there, they're not subscripts, they're usually multiplied or, or times something. What, what does it mean as a subscript? Right, right, okay. Okay, so good question. So if I have a minus one equals to one, a one equals to five, b minus one equals to two, b one equals to six, then suppose you want to compute, let me call it hk. No, hk, h is used for uh, convolution, uh, sorry, uh, impulse response, so let me call it CK. Uh, so if I want to compute, let's say C0, then I have to do A, A minus five B zero, well, CK. A minus five B K plus five, A minus four B K plus four, a one b k minus one. So you basically add, you're adding up a minus five b k plus five, a minus four b k plus four, a minus three b k plus three, a one b k minus one, and so on and so forth. Okay, thank you. Okay, so it will be an infinite series. So you'll have to compute what the summation looks like. Okay, now let's look at why this should be the case. I have xt, which is summation of al e raised to well, phi l t l equals minus infinity to infinity. I have yt equals to k prime equals to minus infinity to infinity bk prime ck prime of t let's multiply the two uh, the two signals what do i get there'll be double summation have any of you multiplied two series before so this is the multiplication of two series. What would this be equal to? Any thoughts? Anyone wants just, to? It yeah. Just be the uh, first summation, second summation, and then the products of the yeah L's and the K things. Terms. Right. Right. A L B K prime, V L T, V K prime T. Now let's look at this multiplication. This is e raised to J 
L omega naught T multiplied by E raised to J K prime omega naught T. So what do I get? I'm multiplying these two exponential signals. So I get E raised to J L plus K prime omega naught T. So now let's k prime equals to minus infinity to infinity a l b k prime e raised to j p l plus k prime t. Now let's define k equals to l plus k prime. then what do I have? So when k prime goes to minus infinity, k goes to minus infinity, when k prime goes to plus infinity, k goes to plus infinity, and k prime is equal to k minus l. Okay, so then I do this change of variables summation k equals minus infinity to infinity a l b k minus l p k t Okay, so I have done just a substitution. The only thing I've done in this step is made this substitution where K goes from minus infinity all the way to plus infinity. And now I can switch the order of summation. So K goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. L goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. AL bk minus l ckt and notice this is exactly equal to ck which is the Fourier coefficient for the multiplication of two signals two periodic signals okay so that's the derivation it's a Somewhat complicated derivation, but but it can be done. Any question on this derivation? All right. This idea, so I'm going to touch about touch upon this particular idea again towards the later part of this course where you multiply the two signals in, uh, so in the time domain, you're multi, you doing multiplication, but in the Fourier domain, you're actually doing convolution. And this is actually a very, very important and central idea in the Fourier series world. So multiplication in time domain is convolution in Fourier domain. Uh, convolution in time domain is multiplication in Fourier domain. So that part is also something we'll study, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's actually a very, it has a very far reaching consequence within the signals and systems area. The next property I want to talk about is conjugation. So if I have XT with the Fourier series as AK, I take the complex conjugate of XT 
the fourier series would be a minus k conjugate Okay, so this is a Fourier series if you conjugate the signal. Again, the proof is fairly straightforward, so I'll proof exercise. The next topic, not the next, pro the next property of Fourier series is Parseval's PAR. Civil's identity. Oh, it's called relation in the book, Parseval's relation. So this is given by one over T integral of zero to T X T square DT is equal to Okay, so this is something like the possible relationship relation is something like the conservation of energy type argument. So if you look at the average energy in the signal, which is typically amplitude square integral with respect to time, and then you divide it by one over T because this is a periodic signal. So if you look at this average energy in the signal, it is equal to the total energy in each component of the periodic signal. Okay, and that's because the component, which is phi k of t, they are all orthogonal to each other. So the total power or total energy would be the same as the energy in individual components all added together. Let's, uh, even though the derivation is not there in the book, let me just do a quick derivation of this result because it's not that difficult. So I have one over T integral zero to capital T X T square DT is one over T summation K equals minus infinity to infinity a k e raised to j k omega naught t so let's let's assume that x t is real so that way i don't have to multiply it by complex conjugate The, the complex conjugate case can also be handled in a similar fashion. It'll just be a more ugly looking expression. So now I have this uh, summation of AK square. K goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. So it's again multiplication of two series. And I can write it as summation, summation, let me write L goes from minus infinity to infinity 
and k prime goes from minus infinity to plus infinity a l a k prime e raised to j Um, now we know that the integral of e raised to j l plus k prime omega naught t dt over zero to t is equal to zero as long as l plus k prime is non-zero. So the only case that remains is, let me just write it in words. We know from lecture 11 that integral zero to capital T e raised to j k omega naught t is equal to zero if k is not equal to zero and it's equal to one if k equals to zero. So this was something that we proved in the previous class lecture 11. So if k is non-zero, then this is a periodic signal. You integrate a periodic signal, you get zero. But if k equals to zero, then this is just equal to one e raised to j k omega naught t is equal to one. And so the overall integral divided by t capital T is going to be equal to one. So I can in substitute this here. And what I get is one over t well, all I'll be left with is summation L equals minus infinity to infinity, K prime equals to minus infinity to infinity. Well, K prime equals to minus L, those are the only terms that will remain. So let me just write it as A L and A minus L. That's it. And because XT was real, this is exactly equal to this was also done in lecture 11. Okay, so this is the derivation of Parseval's relation. It's not there in the book, but uh, I'm, I hope that this derivation uh, gives you some intuition about where this result comes from. Any questions so far? Okay, so let's look at an example where we compute the Fourier series for a very, very, uh, uh, well, let's, let's look at Fourier series for impulse train. Okay, so I have this, what is an impulse train? So in, in impulse train, what you have is, you have like a sequence of impulses, all, so zero, capital T, two capital T, minus T, minus two T. 
this this is the time so this is a periodic signal because you have unit impulses uh, at every capital t interval this is called an impulse train okay so we all know an annoying friend who will come to our door and who will press the doorbell every 2 seconds or every 1 second and so that annoying friend is basically sending an impulse train to us by pressing the doorbell every capital t seconds now you can annoy that friend by telling them what the fourier series coefficient of this periodic signal is so let's look at the fourier series coefficient i can compute ak to be 1 over capital t 0 to capital t well let me take minus minus t over 2 to t over 2 of uh, the signal x of t so which is delta of t e raised to minus j k omega not t t t what is this integral equal to just 1 over 2 or 1 1 over t yeah this will be 1 over capital t so the reason why it's 1 over capital t is because remember that there is a sampling property of the impulse signal so the sampling property is this is equal to delta t e raised to minus j k omega not time 0 which is equal to delta t so i'm just integrating delta t from minus t over 2 to plus t over 2 and then i'm dividing it by t so i get 1 over t okay so in impulse train as you can see there is uh, all the all the signals all the periodic signals have the same strength so ak is equal to 1 over t for all k this is true for all k okay so it has now now imagine each of these are periodic signals each of these are sinusoidal signals or cosine signals but you add up like infinite number of sines and cosine signals and what you get is an impulse train which is a discontinuous signal it's discontinuous everywhere so at zero the value of the signal is infinity and outside like after zero between zero to t the value of the signal is zero at t the value of the signal is plus infinity but after t to 2t like between capital t to capital 2t uh the value of the signal is zero so it's a highly discontinuous signal but because it's periodic it has a fourier series expansion and the fourier series has the same strength for all possible harmonics it's a very special class of signal okay so we have seen a fourier series computation of two signals we saw the fourier series computation of a square wave in the previous class and in this class we talked about the fourier series uh, computation for a uh, impulse train and then if you have more complex periodic signal you can compute the fourier transform in an appropriate fashion 
Um, in real world, you will almost always use MATLAB or some such uh, tool to do the integral for you to compute the Fourier coefficients. Okay. Now let's talk about Fourier series computation for discrete time signals. So, so far we have talked about all continuous time signals. Let's uh, focus on the discrete time signals. So let me recap. A discrete time signal is periodic if there exists a capital N such that X of N plus capital N is equal to X of N for all N in complex, uh, sorry, in the set of integers. If you remember, this is uh, our discussion in probably lecture three or four. The harmonically related periodic signals in discrete time are given by phi k n, which is e raised to j k omega naught n. K goes from zero to n minus one. And omega naught is equal to two pi over capital N. Okay, we had mentioned that as K becomes N, that signal is so phi N of N is the same as phi zero of N which is the same as phi minus n of n. So that's why there are only like capital N number of distinct periodic signals that are harmonically related in the case of discrete time signals. So that's different from the continuous time case. So in particular, the K plus R capital N, N is the same as the K of N, where R is any integer. Okay, so I hope everyone remembers this discussion from our lecture three or four. So period, this is the definition of periodic signal. And this is the definition of harmonically related periodic signals. Okay, now, based on these definitions, I can write if Xn is periodic, then I can write Xn as k equals zero to n minus one, a k of phi k n, which is the same as This is the Fourier series representation of periodic signal. Hmm. 
Now, once again, we are faced with the challenge The challenge is how to compute AK. Right? We did the we had the same challenge in the continuous time Fourier Fourier series. And we are facing with we are faced with the same challenge here as well. How do we compute AK? And the idea again is extremely similar to what we had discussed earlier, which is uh, you compute the value of AK by uh, taking the, well, in this case, it's not integral, so it'll be summation, taking the summation with phi minus K of N, just like we did in the continuous time case. So the fact AK will be given by summation XN e raised to minus JK omega naught N, N goes from zero to capital N minus one. Okay, so that's how we compute the value of AK. And while I'm going to leave the proof as an exercise, I am going to give a an hint. And the hint is as follows. If you look at the summation, n equals to zero to capital N minus one of phi k n. This is, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm missing a one over n here. So please do note, there is a one over n in the definition for a k. No, 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 this, this is incorrect. K equals to zero plus minus N. So it so turns out that summation of phi k of n would be equal to zero if k is not equal to zero or not equal to plus n or minus n or not equal to plus two n or minus two n and so on and so forth. So with this hint, you can actually show that the hint plus this equation So you use the hint and that equation to show that AK is given by this particular expression. One over N summation of XN e raised to minus JK omega naught N. So that's all I have for today. Uh, in the next class, we are gonna talk about properties of discrete time Fourier series, uh, or sorry, Fourier series for discrete time signals. And then we'll look at a few examples. Uh, where we will compute the Fourier coefficients by hand. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'll see you guys on Friday. Thanks. Thanks. Have a good one. Thank you.